I wonder if you find it hard to get the beginning of your letter. I mean, I, the number of letters I have started, you know, dear such and such, and I've written a line and then I've scrapped it because it wasn't the right line. It's always hard to get those first few lines, I think. Well, that's unless you're writing a professional letter and things like that are, I suppose, pretty clear what you ought to say. But a personal letter is very different. The Apostle Paul seemed to, seems to have a sort of a pattern that gives you a, a sense about his, the nature of his relationship to people. So verse 8 says in chapter 1, Let me say first that I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. Do you know, can you imagine just jumping straight in and saying to someone, Dear Ian, dear Mary, dear Anne, dear Siobhan, I just want to tell you how much I am really impressed about the way you are doing this, that or the other. It wouldn't really be the sort of thing you would do to somebody you didn't know. And yet Paul doesn't know these people. He knows one or two of them, but he doesn't know the most of them. I think this is really something encouraging for us just to think about. When someone's able to speak freely about us in a positive way, and in a way that's so commanding, kind of like out there, just put it out there. What a way to build up an individual. What a way to build a relationship with that person. And it's not a flattering thing. He's telling the truth. It's a simple word that's a great means of uniting them, even when they've never met. Think about it. If someone was to say to you, let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you. Because of your faith, it's being talked about all over our community. And then he goes on to tell them, well, God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night, I bring, I, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. Day and night, he says, I bring your needs in prayer to God. Wow. He knows their needs. How does he know their needs if he doesn't know them? Well, I suspect that he knows many things that are common in the Christian life, many things that are common in a human life. In fact, as he will go on to explain the gospel and describe the gospel in the rest of this letter, Lots of the things that he says there are common to all of us. He'll talk about his struggles. He'll talk about faith. He'll talk about truth. He'll talk about all sorts of interesting, challenging things that we encounter every day. So I just think this is a great way to begin. Now, it might be a challenge to you and I to start to do this in a more open way with one another. I think that would be tremendous that we would actually say to people the, the uplifting and encouraging things that we should about them. The things we pray in private that we might say publicly to their face. So Paul's very happy to tell them the story. And he tells it simply. And that's one of the best ways to do it. Just tell the story. It's a story about his relationship with them. Even though he knows a few of them, he's already bound to them in his heart. And then he expresses a number of longings. Longings. There's a passion in Paul. It's great to meet people who are passionate. I remember a friend of mine once, he said, coming to church was good when you hear someone who's got passion, even though, you know, other things may not be mighty and, and, and deep, he says, but if they're passionate about it, it really helps. So what's the longings? Are the longings in his heart? Well, first of all, there's a longing to come and see them. He said, one of the things I always pray is for the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you, for I long to visit you. Isn't that an interesting thing? He's telling them, it's, I just really would love to get along to see you so that I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord, to encourage you in your faith and be encouraged by yours. Let's pause for a minute there and think. Paul's praying. He's praying about this desire to go and visit them. He longs to visit them. And I think in his prayers, night and day, as they come to his mind, whether he had them in his mind or he had them on a page, I don't know, he's, he's thinking about, how can I get to visit them? And he's also thinking about, how can I continue to express the longing in my heart to tell people the good news? Now, he's writing perhaps at the end of 57 AD or maybe at the beginning of 58. He's writing from Corinth, 
and he's then going to go to Jerusalem with a gift, but he doesn't realise the story as it's going to unfold for the next year or two. His prayers to come and see that the church in Rome will be answered, but in a very, very different way to what he thought. As the story unfolds, told for us by Dr. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles, you can read it there from Acts 21 to 27. It does take up a large section of that account. He goes to Jerusalem with the gifts of money for the believers who are experiencing hardship. But then he is arrested and some of the Jews want him to be punished. Some of them want to be killed. Yes, they have long memories. (laughs) They remember this Paul who used to be leading them on the charge against the Christians and now he is a Christian. So, being a Roman citizen, he appeals to the emperor that he might get a just and fair hearing, which is his right, and it's what he does and what he gets. But does he realise how that's going to turn out? No. The dramatic sea crossing, the hurricane, the shipwreck, being ending up on Cyprus, experiencing a mini-revival of, of the Lord's work in Cyprus, and then finally coming to Italy and being met there, at the seaport, and to be accompanied all the way on the Via Appia into Rome. Do you know, you never know how God will answer your prayers. <laughs> but trans- translating longings into prayer is the greatest thing. We all have longings, and we ought to translate our longings into prayer. And God will, God will certainly work through those longings and those prayers. I don't doubt that the Holy Spirit has been part of the story why the longings exist in our hearts. What does he want to do for them? Well, he says he wants them to grow strong. He says, I want to come and bring you a spiritual gift. And spiritual gift, I think he means using his own gifts to bless them that will help you grow strong in the Lord. Longing to see growth, not static. That's what he wants. Isn't that also a challenge? We do not remain as we are. Change is always happening. We're either progressing or perhaps we're regressing. But the Lord wants us to grow. And then he tells another about another longing. He wants to see, uh, he, wants, he has this longing about telling the other people. He goes on to talk about this longing. He says, He says, I've been prevented now, but I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit. That's his longing. Spiritual fruit is another way of saying, I want to see more people come to put their trust in the Lord Jesus. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated. I am longing, I am eager to come to you in Rome to preach the good news. Some translations talk about, I have a great debt, or I'm under obligation. And so it's more than just a longing. It's a, there's a number of factors feeding into this. And anyone who knows about the grace of God, about the way to be forgiven and saved, is under an obligation, surely, to let others know it. Because one of the first things that happens to us is that we see people in a whole new way. We, we see them as people who have needs. Deep spiritual needs, deep heart needs, deep core needs. And we look at them, I think, the way Jesus looked at the people as sheep without a shepherd. And so that sense of, oh, I have been given this great gift. I have been given this insight, this understanding. I've been given the the means by which the truth has been opened up to me. Now there's an obligation in my life to tell other people. I mean, put ourselves in their shoes. There was a time whenever we were just drifting along aimlessly to the edge of the precipice, but God came and rescued us. So he says, you will be my witnesses, and that's what he promises. It's God willing, Paul says. He trusts the Lord's hand in this matter. He knows that, you know, God will open up, he says. He says, verse 10, he says, I'm praying that God willing, and God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect, as he will say later on in Romans So these are some of the longings, and it makes me just finish with three little takeaway thoughts. Number one, who are we personally interested in? Some others that we pray for, that we're burdened for. Secondly, do we need to tell someone how how they've encouraged and inspired us and what we are praying for them? 
And thirdly, do we realize the debt we owe to others to tell them the good news? I think these are wonderful things to pray about this morning. And the Lord bless you as you do so. And we'll catch up tomorrow. God bless.